Well, Pastor Joby, thank you so much for joining me. It's an honor to have you again, buddy. My pleasure. It's good to be back. Hope we're going to talk Braves baseball and world championships. How about that? <laughs> That's it. That is always a good topic. That is always a good topic. Never, never get tired of talking about that. You know, you've written a brand new book on miracles and uh, you just came off a miracle. You and I, before we got on this call, you, you, you said something, you, you said, I came off an epic weekend. Tell everybody a little bit about the miracle that you just experienced this past weekend. Yeah, for a little bit of context, I've been in ministry on staff at church for 30 years straight, never with no gaps in between, planted this church, the Church of 1122, coming up on 11 years ago, and we're about, our our broadcast location is about maybe three miles from the Atlantic Ocean in Jacksonville, Jacksonville Beach area. And so every year we do a big beach baptism celebration. And uh, this Sunday afternoon, we baptized 1,125 people in the Atlantic Ocean. That uh, over 1,100 times I heard people scream out, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And uh, <laughs> thankfully I had help dunking people. But I actually, my, I had my hands on probably about 250 of them. And it was... Um, I mean, everybody from like retirees to CEOs to a bunch of students, middle school kids, uh, a couple of former strippers. We have this uh, ministry here called Hadassah's Hope where a bunch of girls go into the strip clubs and provide dinner uh, on Sunday afternoons to these girls and just try to over time share the gospel with them anyway. I mean, every every color person, every type of person, we had disabled people, we had pro athletes. I mean, you just name it, man. It, it was, um, it was pretty epic. It's a little overwhelming after, after I dunked my last person and then you just look back up on the beach and there was probably four or 5,000 people standing on the beach. Uh, in addition to the thousand people getting dunked and you just think, man, who in the heck am I that I get to even be a part of this thing? So it, it was, it was awesome. You know, you said something really interesting that behind every one that went into that water, there was a name and there was a story. Why is their stories a miracle to you? So this provides a little context for where we're going to be diving in. What do their stories, and there's lots, as you said, I mean, for every facet of life, why do their stories represent a miracle to you? Well, the only eternal miracle is salvation. Mm. I mean, the, you know, <laughs> like the Lazarus came out of the grave, but he went back in. He died again, right? So, and it's the only guaranteed miracle. That's for right. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so, uh, and it is way more impossible for somebody's sins to be forgiven than for a physical ailment to be cured. You know, I think about one of the miracles I talk about. That's the, right. The guy with the four friends that dig a hole through the roof and drop him through, and Jesus says, "You're you're." your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees are like, who are you to forgive sins? And then Jesus asked a very important question, which is easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or for me to say, get up and walk. Mm -hmm. Well, the key word there is say, it's easy to say your sins are forgiven. Cause how can you tell? You don't know until the great white throne judgment. Right. Um, but it's hard to say, get up and walk. Cause you're going to find out in about three seconds. Did it work? Mm. But it's way harder to accomplish the forgiveness of sin. I mean, if you are the sovereign king of the universe that came up with the idea of legs, then how hard is it for you to speak into existence legs that work? No yep. problem. But in order for Jesus to actually pull off the forgiveness of sin, the second person of the Trinity has to wrap himself in flesh, be obedient to the Father, be tempted in every way, choose life in his Father every single time, and then go to the cross, die a sinner's death, lock up hell, walk out with the keys and leave the empty tomb behind. That's yeah. way more difficult. And so that is what we were experiencing. And I'm not trying to minimize the miracle. I, I mean, I don't want to be like every breath we take is a miracle. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But it is truly miraculous when somebody spiritually dead comes to life. Um, and so that's what we witnessed this weekend. Why do you think so many people, and I think so many people even sitting in churches 
think miracles were something that were just evident in the Bible. They they really don't happen. I mean, Joby, come on. That really doesn't happen now. Why do you think they miss what could be all around them? I mean, I think the same reason that the Pharisees missed. I mean, come on. The Pharisees studied their Bible like crazy, went to more church services than anybody. And they are two feet away from the very son of God. They could smell the breath of God, but the mm -hmm. breath of God ain't inside them. And I think, I mean, like after Jesus comes out, I mean, after Jesus raises Lazarus, the next thing that happens in the gospel of John is they throw a party at Simon the leper's house. And some people go and tell everybody in Bethany, this man who claims to be God brought this guy Lazarus out of the grave and they believe. The mm -hmm. Bible says some mm -hmm. saw and believed. And then other people's other people went and told on Jesus to the Pharisees. So the Pharisees get together and have a meeting. And they say, if people keep following him, we're going to lose everything. They should be throwing a party, but instead they're throwing a fit. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're throwing a fit is because Jesus does not fit into their religious construct. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of my greatest fears as a pastor of a big old growing church is that people would miss Jesus. And get focused on all the wrong things. Or think about this. Pool of Bethesda. Jesus looks at this guy. He's been there for 38 years. Says, take up your mat and walk. So he's healed. He picks up that nasty mat, starts walking around with it. And when the Pharisees encounter him, they can't see the miracle because they can't see past his mat. Mm. And they're like, you're doing this on the wrong day. Which, by the way, is a total rule that they made up and added to That's the right. Levitical law. That was not they made that law up about what you could and could not carry on the Sabbath. And so I'm afraid that people can't see past their own circumstances to see the miraculous work of God. Look, I was at his conference not very long ago with John Tyson. You know him? He's awesome. Yep. And he just said this one line before he hit, like right when he was starting, he said, you know where the Holy spirit shows up where he's wanted. And I thought, man, I want to be the kind of church leader. I want to be the kind of follower that wants the spirit of God to show up. As you walk this, Joby, as you journey, how do you, how do you keep your eyes focused on that and your heart protected from where the Pharisees who all began with good intentions, most of them began with good intentions. How do you keep, your eyes and your heart where you don't miss the miracles happening literally like the life change. We were talking about one of the stories. How do you keep your eyes and your heart protected? What would you say? I'll tell you. Um, I don't know what it is about me. The individual stories of, of people's lives at our church, they wreck me, man. I mean, they just wreck me. And uh, gosh, I hope that, that never, ever, ever changes, you know? Because um, I can tell you just personally, I can't get over the gospel myself. Mm. If I think about it too much, it'll get me all messed up. That Not only that he would save me, if he just saved me and killed me and took me to heaven, that'd be enough. But that he would save me and call me his own and call me by name and call me his son and then equip me and ordain me and anoint me for a time as this to lead this thing that I get to be a part of. I just can't get over it, man. I don't know. So I don't, I don't think a whole lot about the 1,125 people. I just think about he saved me and mm. some of the individual stories of the people that I get to intersect with and just, just quite overwhelmed with the fact that he would use me. Mm. You, you define a miracle in the book. Miracles are that intersection where the unexplainable meets the undeniable. When you look back at scripture and you see these miracles that happened, what is it that grabs you most about the everyday journey of Jesus over those three years? Because you you break apart nine of the miracles. We're going to just take two or three of them. You break apart nine of them. What is it about them that grabs you as a reader? I mean, you weren't there, sure. but, but you've been there. You've been to Israel. <laughs> what bunch. is it about it that grabs you? Here, here's the thing. Um, 
kind of to one of your earlier questions too, man. I've read the Bible cover to cover. I do not see term limits on the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> I don't think there's an expiration date on the miraculous power of God. And so, I mean, Jesus said we would do even greater things than he did, right? So I, I, I still believe in the miraculous. And I am not a hyper charismatic guy. I mean, mm -hmm. I was saved at a fundamentalist Baptist camp and they knew how to fun, put the fun in fundamentalism. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but, but here's the thing about the miracles. The miracles were never the point. They always pointed to the message. Like mm, every good. time Jesus does a miracle, like take the book of John, for example, they don't ever call them miracles. John calls them signs or signs and wonders. And a sign points to something greater than itself. And so... Like, like if you pull into, if you, if you were rolling down 95 South from where you live and you get to the sign that says Jacksonville, that sign isn't Jacksonville. It's pointing to this greater thing. That sign just represents a thing. It's pointing you to something. And so Jesus is never just flexing his raw power. He's always pointing to the redemptive purpose of God. Mm. So he never just levitates everybody and be like, wasn't that cool? I think a part of what he's doing is he's peeling back the curtain. And he's saying, listen, this world has been broken by sin, and I want you to see what an unbroken world looks like. And so, sure, I can turn water to wine. First of all, I spoke it into existence, and one day there's going to be a there's going to be a wedding supper of the Lamb, and that's the next time I drink wine is I'm going to be sitting with you, my bride, the church, and we're going to be celebrating a wedding. Uh, the reason I'm going to tell this man to get up and walk is because in heaven, nobody walks with a swagger or a limp. And mm -hmm. the reason I'm going to wash this man's eyes so that he can see is there's going to come a day where you're going to see your heavenly father face to face. And maybe a part of what he's doing is peeling back the curtain mm -hmm. to, to what the pre Genesis three world might look like before sin fractured it. So he tells Jerry says, he's like, Hey, no, nah, your, your daughter ain't dead. No, 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 no. Cause nobody's dead in heaven. And so mm -hmm. she's going to get up. You, you say in there, three things are needed for every miracle. Belief, hope, and faith. That's it. Why are those three the, the secret sauce of being able to believe and see a miracle? What would you say? So I, I think the part of the reason I wrote this, I think the Bible-believing evangelical church needs a gospel-saturated book on miracles. Because the mm -hmm. point is, we're not chasing after the miracle. That's right. And even if you don't get your miracle met, I want you to meet the maker of miracles. That's the point. Um, I think the best way, the lens by which you pray for and see miracles, if you go all the way back to Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego about to go into the fiery furnace, and their statement to Nebuchadnezzar, I think is the right kind of hope-filled, faith-filled kind of statement. We know that he can save us. Mm -hmm. We are believing in this instance that he will. And even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down to your idols. So I think that's the way you approach it. Like, I know we can. I've read it in the book. Yep. One time, he it's, it looks like he accidentally healed this one lady one time. Like, she just touched him and got the <laughs> heel button on the hem of his garment. And so, so I know he can. I've read about yep. it. And I am believing. I mean, look, he's a good dad, loves to give good gifts to his kids. He says, you have not because you ask not. I think I think if, if you don't pray the kind of prayers that are absolutely intimidating to you, that may be insulting to God, he can handle it. So just throw them his way. And then his ways are still not our ways. So even if he doesn't do what you think he ought to do, either way, I'm still going to pick up my doubts and unanswered prayers and questions and follow after him. And in this book, I wrote one chapter on what do you do when God doesn't do what you ask him to do? That's right. And then I wrote another chapter on what is the right response to the miraculous work of God. Because mm. what's crazy is while I was writing this book, I had I had the two extremes in my own personal life happen. One of my best friends died. We were on a hunting trip together in Scotland. We go up in the Highlands chasing Red Stag. He has a massive heart attack. 56-year-old former football player, in way better shape than the rest of us. Massive heart attack goes down. And so how do you handle that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you handle that? And so I write a, a chapter on John chapter six, when Jesus starts teaching crazy stuff, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And uh, can you imagine if you were one of the people there taking notes and he says, you got to eat my flesh. <laughs> and you're like, did he say fish? He didn't say flesh. <laughs> I mean, we're Jews. We can't even eat pork, much less yep. the prophet, right? 
And then he doesn't explain mm. anything, which is in our Western American, the American people deserve to know, kind of mine. We think, just explain it, man. Just explain you're talking about the gospel, and we're going to remember the gospel via a little bit of pita bread and some grape juice. You don't yep. have to actually like become a carnival or or a, or a, eat a piece of his tricep or whatever, yep. right? He explains nothing. He looks at the disciples and says, do y'all want to leave? So when, when I pray and pray and pray and I've got it all figured out and God won't run my play, and I begin to think, God, what are you doing? Peter's answer is what helps me. When Peter says, to whom shall we go? Mm. Mm. Here's what he knows. To walk away from you is to walk towards something else. And then he says, because you're the only one that offers eternal life. And then he says, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ. Mm. You see, I think that order matters. They believed first, and then they came to know who he was. Yep. We want to cut. We want to know and get everything figured out before we decide if we want to believe. So that helped me a lot in in the passing of my friend Bradley, and he was our general contractor, builds all our churches. Oh, we had three more campuses under contract while when he went to be with the Lord. Then on the other end of it, another one of my best friends, who was a guy, a pastor that planted this church with me, our original worship pastor, his name Ben. Our families are on vacation together down at Disney. He goes down with a seizure. They scan him. He's got a cancerous brain tumor. And they tell him, we rush him to the hospital. They do all that stuff. Next day, they say, you've got three years to live. In 18 months, you'll be in hospice. That was two years ago. We came to church, prayed like crazy, goes into surgery. Come out of surgery at Mayo here in Jacksonville, and they said, We think we got it. A year ago, he was tumor and cancer free. And this past Sunday, he was not in hospice. He was in the Atlantic Ocean helping me baptize 1,100 people. So, Matt, I mean, what do you do? We pray. Sometimes God heals, sometimes he doesn't. But here's the thing, man. Here's here's what we point to over and over and over is. God is at work in all things for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Mm. And his ways are not our ways. And even when we're going through it, man, there's a glory he is storing up for us. We can't even get our minds around. But there will come a day where he peels back the curtains. We walk into his presence, and then we'll see completely. My Mm. friend Brad's already going to be there. That's right. And we'll walk in and go, look at you. you. There you go again, God. Like I couldn't figure it out back when I was at home, but now that I'm home forever, look at I knew I knew you had a perfect plan. I knew you'd be glorified, and one day I'll be able to see. You you said a line there, Pastor Joby, that was so interesting to me. If our prayers don't intimidate us, they insult God. They might insult God. Sure. Why is that? Why why? For, for those of us that want to play it safe, that we go, man, God just wants me to be in my box and to, to live, just to live, live here in my Honda Accord life, you know, just getting, getting through. Why should our prayers intimidate us? What would you say? Um, all right. How about this? Speaking of miracles, wedding at Cana, they run out of wine. Um, Mary goes to Jesus. They're out of wine, son. She says something. Husbands never quote this to your wife. Woman, what does this have to do with me? Yeah. <laughs> and then she gathers the servants together and gives the best advice in the whole Bible to what it means to be a disciple. John 2, 5, she says, do whatever he tells you to do. Mm. Okay. Well, everything he tells them to do for the next five steps is ludicrous. Yep. Get the six stone jars, top them back off with water. You mean the ones with all the dirty hand washing water? Yeah, 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 that. Somebody go get a ladle, dip some out. Give it to the master of ceremonies. None of that makes any sense at all in the natural. And little do they know there's a miracle hanging on the other end of about six steps of obedience that don't make any sense that we're still talking about today. Yep. Same thing with like um, the feeding of the 5,000. He gets the little boys lunchable, prayer, he blesses it, hands it out to the disciples. So it's not just five loaves and two fish. They have a 12th of two fish and five loaves in their hand. And then Matthew says that Jesus says, you feed them. And they're like, this don't make any sense at all. All right. If you can figure out all of the strategies of how you were moving forward, then what do you need him for? 
Mm. I cannot find, let me, I can't think of a thing in the New Testament that is not just bold and audacious every single time God moves. I mean, it's take the gospel to the dangerous place. Forgive the person that you feel like is unforgivable. I'll give you the words if they, I mean, the worst thing, what's the worst thing they can do? Kill your body? That's what Jesus Mm. says. Don't worry about that. If all they can do is kill your body, you'd be like, what? That seems that seems pretty bold. He says, yeah, but don't don't be afraid. And there's only one reason to not be afraid, because I'll be with you. Mm. So if you don't need him, then why are you praying? Mm. And I promise you this, if you're obedient to him, you're going to need him every step of the way. That's right. You know, it's so funny, too, in, in that his first miracle, and I love, I love the wedding, but we've married in the past year. So my daughter got married in October of uh, 21, and my son got married in the summer of 22, or 21, summer of 20, which my daughter's fall of 20, my son, son was summer of 21. Weddings are a big deal. And that's, that's, little girl getting ready to walk down that aisle, it's a, it's, call me. It's it's a big one. Um, <laughs> I'll need to. <laughs> it's interesting because he takes such care of that wedding because that wine back then represented a lot at the wedding. Why does his care about how the wedding came out for that family and the master of ceremonies? Why does his care about that miracle say so much to his care about us? I well, I think it's so multi-layered. I mean, if you back up from the Bible a little bit, God's really into weddings. The whole book starts with a wedding, it ends with a wedding, and his earthly ministry is kicked off with a wedding. Um the the marriage is the preeminent picture of Jesus' relationship with his church. That Mm -hmm. is a really big deal. On the very local level, um, contextually to the first century hospitality was everything i mean if you were the if you were the family provide you know putting this wedding on you had a year to prepare for this thing and if you came up short it was screaming to everybody in the community this man does not have what it takes to take care of this woman Mm -hmm. it would have been not just slightly embarrassing i mean it would have been it would have wrecked them and their and who they were in that community from then on. And then what I think, a little bit of speculation, but you can give me a little bit of hermeneutical license. I think what Jesus is doing is what every single person at a wedding does. And I mean, every single person. He's thinking, I wonder what my wedding is going to be like. Mm. And now if you're new to Bible study, people are saying, whoa, 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 Jesus wasn't married. Yeah, not here on earth, but the book of Revelation says that there is a great wedding supper. Mm. and Maybe he's putting himself in the shoes of that groom that had to prove that had to pay what it costs to pull off that party. And Jesus is saying, you know what's going to cost me for me to get married? It, he's going to hold later, he's going to hold up a cup full of wine and say, is this is my blood. Mm. And what it is going to cost him is his very own blood. Mm. And so weddings are a big, big deal, which by the way, I don't want to get all political, but just be biblical. This is why things like the redefinition of marriage and these kind of things are an attack on the character and nature of God. I'm not saying we don't care for people and that, but I'm just telling you, these things are sacred to God. God came up with this idea of marriage, not us. So we don't get to jack around with it. It is a really, really big deal. You know, it's so funny. I've been around the block for a little while and taught this many times. Till I was the father of the bride. I mean, I've done probably 500 weddings through the right, years. Yeah. You know, I tried to make a little money for vacation there through the years. And <laughs> totally. so I've done a lot, I've done a lot of weddings and enjoy them. I actually enjoy them. Um, when I stood at the, when I stood there with my daughter and that was my party in her honor, mm. I mm. felt that I felt it a little differently. I wonder the satisfaction he had when it wasn't just good wine. Oh. It was the the best one. There's a significance in that. Why do you think when Jesus does it, he does it all out, and it really wasn't for his benefit. He didn't do it for people to look at him. He did a, he did it for people to look at them, right? 
Yeah, the only people that know it's his wine are the servants and Mary. That's right. But listen, it's just who he is. Mm. He can only act within his character and That's nature. Right. So he can only be just. He can only love. He can only be merciful. That's just who he is. So when he makes stuff, he doesn't make junk. It's mm. like it's not in his capacity to to just kind of mail it in to mm. halfway do it. I mean, if, if he speaks something into existence, man, it's exactly what it he wanted it to be every single time. I can tell you, it's funny. Um, I mean, for a long time when I was when I would do, I've done a million weddings too. And I've done some doozies, right? Uh, I mean, especially here in Jacksonville, I've yep. married people on the 18th green of the TPC Sawgrass. I've, you know, I've seen orchestras and ice sculptures. And I mean, and for the longest time, especially the younger I was, I was really pragmatic. And I thought, what a waste of money, man. Why are they wasting all this money? And in regards to like, the, the amount of money you spend on your wedding has virtually no impact on your marriage. So, nope. well, it, it could impact it very negatively. You could start <laughs> out in debt. It could be very bad. That is true. But I mean, I tell that when I do premarital counseling, I'm like, listen, man, there's going to be a wedding and then there's a marriage and, you know, that's about 60 years. <laughs> however, however, my daughter's 13 years old and a uh, beautiful little blonde girl and you know, let's say in 10 years or whatever. So she walks down that aisle, bro. At this point in my life, I would spare no expense for that little girl. You know, and if people are like, what a waste of money. Hey, man, mm -mm. that's mine to waste. I'm going to glorify God and throw that's the right. biggest wedding party I can afford. You will, you will end that evening like my wife and I did. And we got home that night. So the funny, funny part of the story, we we're talking about the Braves earlier. She, my daughter, because my son played baseball and I've coached baseball. I coach high school baseball now and uh, for fun. That's my hobby. I don't hunt, but I coach baseball every afternoon. Yeah. And so my daughter's like despises baseball fields. The night they got married was the Braves Dodgers. The night the Braves clinched against the Dodgers. <laughs> really? And her husband, who doesn't care anything about baseball, got a room at the Omni overlooking the field. So for her wedding night she got she got reined in with the tomahawk chop it was a beautiful thing but we got my wife and i got in that night and we didn't think about the money mm -mm. we thought about the faces and i'm just telling you man that that he chose that miracle first is powerful so powerful and that he did it with a joy and it was his mom's idea you know there's just so much symbolism in that man there's so much in it joby there's a guy driving in Atlanta traffic or Jacksonville traffic. And he's going, man, that's great. I, I believe it. But I don't know if I'll ever see it in my own life. What would you tell a guy like that? You better fight for it. <laughs> I mean, think about this. Jesus has been doing miracles. He's on the Sea of Galilee. He gets back to kind of home base, Capernaum. Comes rolling in and Jairus comes running to him. Synagogue leader. And his kid is on their deathbed. And he wants to believe. I mean, mm, mm. and and all of a sudden, because if you were the synagogue leader, especially at a town like that, that was a that was like a thriving city. I mean, you were the dude, man. You had influence, you had power, you had money, you had titles, you had a fancy hat, people came to you for stuff. And if you've ever had a sick kid, ain't no mm. pain like kid pain. And none of that stuff can do anything for him. And you would trade it all in in one second. And he humbles himself before this rabbi, this nobody rabbi. And so I would pre-decide that that would be my posture. And then before Jesus answers that guy's request, there's this woman with the issue of blood, which is terrible that that's how she's referred to. I'm glad God yep. doesn't refer to us by our issues, right? Yep. Aren't you glad you don't show up to church? But hey, there's Ted, the guy with the issue of anger. And there's Nancy, his wife with the issue of complaining. You know, come on, drippy drip. And so, and then this woman who I believe her faith is rooted in the promises of Malachi 4. That the son of righteousness will come with healing in his wings. He, it, mm. The word is kanoth. Mm. Like it, it, the edge of a garment is what it means. And I think she's heard the stories about this Jesus, and she's thinking, what if it's true? 
I mean, just mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. if it's true? Because if you're just riding around and don't need a miracle, you don't, I don't know that you are at the place where you are hungry and thirsty for it. But the Bible says that this woman who has been an outcast for 12 years said she's been to every single doctor and she's got no more money left. And so he is her only hope. And so she's going to put all her hope, not in some kind of magic trick, but she what she's actually believing in is that the word of God is true. Mm. That's what she's believing in. And she goes, I think that's him. I think that's the guy Malachi talked about. There was 400 years of silence and he's been roaming around here for like a year and a half or so. I think this is who he is talking about. And if this is who Malachi is talking about, God always keeps his promises. And if I can just fight through this crowd, if I can just get to the kanaf, the edge of his garment, the wing, there's the, my Bible says there's healing there. That's right. So she fights through it. And I just think the guy driving that you're talking about has got to fight through a different crowd. He's just got to fight through a crowd of doubt or fight through a crowd of embarrassment or fight through a crowd of pride. And then what's crazy, man. I mean, there's no doubt that, that these two miracles are sandwiched together because Jairus's daughter is 12 years old. She's been, she's this woman's got the issue of blood for 12 years. He's a prominent person with a name. She's a nameless person that's been outcast. I mean, every it's a big miracle sandwich and Jesus is right there at the middle of it. And then he says, who touched me? Everybody's like, come on boss. Everybody's touching you. They're pressing against you. And then he, she thinks she's busted and he looks at her and my commentary calls her the woman with the issue of blood. My Bible says Jesus calls her daughter. Mm. Mm. That's it. So again, the these miracles were not the point in and of themselves. They were to That's point right. people to the miracle maker. Your book, it's phenomenal. There's nine of them. We've hit a couple of them. But there's a word that sort of flows between all of them. And I want to end on this word. It's the word desperateness. You know, I think all of those miracles, it was desperate. They run out of wine. It's desperate. My friend can't walk. We got to get him in the ceiling. I'm desperate because I can't stop bleeding. I'm desperate because my daughter's dying. I'm desperate because there's all these, there's 5,000, there's 20,000 people on a hillside that need something to eat. Why is desperateness always needed? And what do we have to do to cultivate desperateness in our lives? Well, sometimes your situation will just slam it into your face. So if you're not desperate right now, I would highly encourage you to read this so that you'll be ready for That's him right. when you are. But, but I also kind of think about that. I mean, the last miracle we cover, man, is the giving of the Holy Spirit, That's right? Because right. so, so Jesus is on this mountainside, I don't know, maybe 120 followers. And he's like, all right, I got a, I got a commission for you. All this stuff we've been talking about, I want you to take this message to the ends of the earth. I want you to go make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. But but don't freak out. I'm going to be with you. And they, you know they're freaking out. How in the world are we going to accomplish this? I mean, there's like 12 of us, you know. How are we going to accomplish this? And he's like, hang out here. I got a gift for you. And the gift that he has is the Holy Spirit. I mean, I can tell you this. Um there is no way in the world I could accomplish what God has called me to accomplish, even and especially when everything's going great, when everybody's healthy, when the bills are paid and all that. There's no way I could accomplish what God has called me to accomplish as a Great Commission, Jesus-following believer without being desperate for the power of the Holy Spirit in my own life to do the things that he's called me to do. As we wrap today, Pastor Joby, you know, we've got guys, we've got ladies, we've got professional athletes, we've got CEOs, we've got police chiefs, we've got ball coaches, we've got school teachers and real estate agents. What you've written about is what it's about. It, it In the sense of it all happens, the centerpiece of all the stories is Jesus. That's the center of all the stories, is that encounter, whether meant to or not, there was an encounter with Jesus. Would you mind, and I, and I hate to even ask this, but I just can't think of another way to close this. Would you mind praying over the people that listen to this show Yeah, that they would meet the Jesus that the guy on the mat met, that the master of ceremonies met, 
and that the woman with the issue of blood and all the other miracles that happened that John says there's too many to even write about. I can't even, I can't even write them all. There's so many of them. Would you mind praying over them for that? I'd be honored to. Let's pray. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, God, you are good and you are so gracious. And Lord, we do not look to these minor miracles to prove your existence in the empty tomb. God, the reason that we can believe in the miraculous is because you walked out of the grave. That if the tomb is empty, that's why we can believe that anything is possible. And God, we know that the tomb is empty because on the third day, Jesus came out of that grave and he walked out of the grave. And so we can walk out of death too and walk in a newness of life. And God, you know, you hear the cries of your people. You you are attentive to even the what feels like the most minor detail. But you're a good dad. And like every good dad, God, you just want to be needed because you are needed. And you know that what we need more than anything else is not a miracle. What we need is you. Mm-hmm. And so, God, I do pray for the miraculous that it would move us towards you. So, Lord, I pray. I pray that you would give us the faith and the courage like the like that woman with the issue of blood, that we would fight through whatever circumstances, whatever doubts, whatever fears we might have to just get to you, knowing that when we do, what we will hear from you is son or daughter. So, Lord, whether it's in a people need emotional healing, that, that there's some relational things, Lord, whether it's mental healing, which is really hard for the believer. We look around at our circumstances and we should be happy. We just can't turn happy on. Lord, I pray that you would guard our hearts and minds and give us this peace that transcends all understanding. God, I pray I pray for the man or woman that needs physical healing. God, I pray that you would make their bodies whole so that they could love you with all of their strength. But God, above all else, Lord, I, I pray for healing at the soul level. Mm-hmm. That for men and women listening right now, if they've never put their faith in you, that they would be reconciled unto you, that they would understand what they need as a savior that they would believe somehow that when you died on the cross, that counted for them. And even in this moment, no matter where they are, that they would cry out in the name of the Lord and you would hear them and you would reconcile them unto yourself, adopt them into your very own family. And Lord, we pray this. And the reason we can pray it is because Jesus walked out of that tomb. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.